Good morning, everyone. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our uh, regular meeting, a uh, regular meeting of the Yuma County Board of Supervisors. We're also sitting as all special taxing districts, although we don't like to acknowledge that most of the time, but we are. Uh, this is a meeting of December 17, 2018, and the first item in the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Will everybody please stand up and uh, follow Supervisor McLeod? Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well, you know, I guess the first item in the agenda is called to the public, but before we begin, we do have some, uh, well, I wouldn't, you know, just call them special guests, they're just people that are special. Uh, Charlene Fernandez, for example, our minority leader of the House of Representatives, um, the local house, the state house of representatives, Craig Sullivan from uh, CSA, and we do have an ACO representative, which I, again, Jean Jean, Jean? Jen. Jen. Yeah, I told you, and I'm sure there's, uh, you know, all of you are special, but these are sort of like visitors today, so. All right, we're going to get to it. Uh, the first item in the agenda is call to the public, and call to the public is held for the public's benefit uh, to allow individuals to address issues within the board's jurisdiction. Board members may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to Arizona Revised Statutes, action taken as a result of public comments will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, responding to criticism, or scheduling the matter for further discussion and decision at a future date. Is there anyone in the public that is here that wants to address the board on an item that is not in the agenda? Uh, you know, I'm going to leave this open throughout the meeting, so if there's something in there that comes up, uh, you know, you're welcome to address the board. Um, there's also a, uh, an item here uh, of presentations, proclamations, and appointments, which is uh, a segment of the agenda where board members may discuss the presentation and proclamations and may announce the appointments to the Yuma County Planning and Zoning Commission, the Yuma County Board of Adjustments, and no legal action will be taken. This is an individual situation where a board member can reappoint or appoint someone to one of those particular boards. I don't think we have an opening in those boards, so. All right, so we'll move on then to um, uh, a presentation, uh, the presentation of the Yuma County line by Yuma 77, the Yuma County Government Channel. line. elected officials from across the state recently met in Chandler during the Arizona Association of Counties annual conference. Many of Yuma County's elected were in attendance. The three-day conference allows elected officials like assessors, treasurers, and recorders the opportunity to share their vision of how county government should be shaped in the future. The conference features learning labs on a variety of subjects important to these electeds. Us being a rural county, we have to have a, a, a larger chair at the table, so to speak, okay? We, sometimes we get overpowered by the Maricopa County uh, electorate, and so it, it's really important for the rural counties to come forward and be heard at the legislature. It's anyone's guess how things will go during the upcoming legislative session, but one thing is for sure. Stay tuned to your county line and we'll bring you any major updates during the entire season. Also, a very important evening during the ACO conference and a historic moment. The Arizona Association of Counties is the only state organization that represents all county elected officials. They work side by side with the Arizona County Supervisors Association, who represents all county supervisors. 
Together, these two organizations help further county interests at the state and federal levels. CSA and ACO have been working very well together for many, many years now, and I think whoever is at the helm of either of those associations likes to work together. The fact that we have two from the same county is, is unique and it's fun, but these are people who are dedicated to their associations and dedicated to their county, and that's true in all years. Each of these organizations is led by their elected officials. During last week's conference, ACO elected the Yuma County Recorder Robin stallworth Poquette to serve as their president for 2019. For me, it is phenomenal because we are 15 counties, many of us rural counties, and to be able to represent every one of them in their unique situations in their own community is a challenge and, again, a learning experience because we need to learn what better supports our communities, what better supports the other elected officials. Having Paquette serving as president is certainly an advantage at the state level. But the advantage doesn't stop there. In a first for county governments, Yuma County's own vice chairman of the Board of Supervisors, Russell McLeod, has been elected as the president of the County Supervisors Association. Well, uh, Supervisor McLeod and I have a very good working relationship and have for many years. He's been very involved in CSA going back to when he was a freshman supervisor. And over those years, he's really developed great experience on the legislative process, uh, legislative relationships. But I think most importantly, he's really come to understand what policies at the state level mean at the local level and because of that he's over the years become a great voice for local government and the issues that matter to the constituents in Yuma County and quite frankly every county. It's going to be very challenging but uh, I think Yuma County is going to represent very well. I'm flattered that my peers elected me to this position and I plan to work very diligently and uh, bring our issues and those of all the counties forward to the legislature and to Washington DC. So even before the new year begins, Yuma County is not only poised to be a key player at the state legislature, but a critical component of representing all Arizonans during the legislative session. Stay tuned, we'll bring you updates during the session. And congratulations to both Supervisor Russell McLeod and Recorder Robin stallworth Poquette. We know you'll be busy this year and we wish you luck. In this spotlight, we take a look at a department who is always sensitive to Yuma County employees and customers and provides many benefits that you may not be aware of. Here's an inside look at our Human Resources Department. Human Resources provide innovative, positive recruitment, recognition for our employees, exceptional benefits with the ability to retain and recognize talent. We see over 59,000 applications. It is the employment specialist as well as the HR technician's role to be able to screen all these applications and forward them to various different departments. In the event we experience situations where our applicants have questions, we actually talk to the individuals and we identify for them maybe some areas that they could possibly improve on their resume and usually that has a positive outcome for them. Recognition is not only just the responsibilities that the employee has to their position. It's the service that they provide both to the internal customers as well as the external customers. And we want to be able to look at that recognition through our years of service, ways to provide our employees with positive praise, ways to have employees understand their recognition of professional growth. And through that, if we're able to identify that, then we're able to enrich our programs that we have, which then lends itself to tie into our employee engagement. We offer wellness programs. We offer a lunch and learn once a month. And that lunch and learn is on various different topics. We provide resources for our employees that maybe they are unaware of. And those external customers, when they are interested in who is Yuma County, they can contact us and we will give them a, a, a tremendous overview as to what services Yuma County provides, from a breakdown to the departments, as to also redirecting any type of inquiries to the respective departments so that that external applicant receives the services that they need. You can learn more about human resources by visiting yumacountyaz.gov. Hi, my name is Trisha, and this is your Health Watch.
The Yuma County Public Health Services District would like to share the following tips to ensure your family stays healthy and safe during this busy holiday season. Wash your hands often. Keeping your hands clean is one of the most important steps you can take to avoid getting sick and spreading germs to others. Travel safely. Check weather advisories and road conditions. Make sure everyone buckles their seatbelt regardless of the length of the trip. Check the lights. Take a look at the ones on your tree and in and around your home for exposed or frayed wires, loose connections, or broken sockets. Choose age-appropriate toys. Check to make sure there aren't any small parts or potential choking hazards. Practice fire safety. Never leave burning candles unattended and make sure they are out of reach of children and pets. Check your smoke detectors and fire extinguishers. Finally, don't forget your pets. Keep holiday lights and ornaments out of reach. For further information, please contact the Yuma County Public Health Services District at 928-317-4550. This is all for now. Happy holidays. Until next time, stay healthy, Yuma. Most of you are gearing up for the holiday season, and it's a good guess that you have a Christmas tree. But have you thought about what you're going to do with your live tree after the holidays? The Yuma County Public Works Department has teamed up with the City of Yuma to give you a chance to help preserve the West Wetlands Project. All you have to do is take your tree to a recycling location and they'll do the rest. You can recycle your tree by taking it to the following location. The North Gila Valley Transfer Site, Wednesday, December 26th through Thursday, January 31st from 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. seven days a week except for holidays. If you'd like more information about recycling your tree, just call 341-2500. Before we head out, just a quick reminder about the upcoming holiday season. Remember, Tuesday, December 25th and Tuesday, January 1st are both holidays. Most of the county offices will be closed so that our employees can enjoy the holiday season with their families. We'd like to thank you for joining us for this County Line. If you'd like to watch past episodes, log on to yumacountyaz.gov forward slash VOD. And don't forget, you can join us live on Facebook. Until next year, stay tuned, Yuma County. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, let's not forget that we also have the minority leader in the house and in Yuma County, from Yuma County. Like, like, like trifecta or something. Yeah, close to it. <laughs> All the leadership of the rural counties are here. In this room, actually, today. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Robin isn't here, but she's close enough. Anyway, the next item in the agenda is the consent calendar. The following items are listed under the consent agenda and will be considered as a group and acted upon by one motion with no separate discussion unless a board member so request. In that event, the item will be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. Um, is there any items that uh, anyone wants to pull out? Mr. Chairman, number seven, please. Number seven. All right. You want to, oh, oh. <laughs> okay, number seven. <laughs> you know, I should you you utilize my priority of as a chairman and tell you you can't pull that one. Down. I'll second that. All right. <laughs> yeah. so, okay, anything else? No. Okay, so there's been a motion to uh, approve the consent. Oh, there hasn't been a motion yet. No, Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the consent calendar. Items one through ten, with the exception of number seven. Okay, that didn't sound right. Mm -hmm. if you, once you figure out what number seven is, you will understand that that exception is a little <laughs> weird. But I'll anyway, second. Is there a second? Can this motion and a second to approve consent calendars one through ten, uh, with the exception of item number seven? All those in favor of the motion, signify by stating aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Item number seven, human resources. Approve the reappointment of Marco Antonio Reyes to the County Employee and Benefit Board of Trustees for a three-year term set to expire on December 31st, 2021. You asked for that to be pulled. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I did, Mr. Chairman, and um, the reason I did, I was speaking with a member of the uh, Benefit Trust, mm -hmm. and they suggested it might be a good idea that the supervisors rotate through annually so they had a better understanding of the employee needs and the benefits packages so the only time we can talk about that obviously is at a board meeting so i thought it was i thought it was a good suggestion i don't have a lot of feeling either way i just thought i would toss that out there um, because it was suggested to me so good morning chairman rayers and members of the board felicia frosto human resource director 
Our current trust document um, right now states that our elected official, our supervisor who is appointed to the YCBT is determined on a three-year term basis. So we would have to look at revising the trust document to reflect that it, it would be alternating a supervisor each year. But you wouldn't have to say alternating. You could just say an annual appointment. Oh, well, the appointments are for three years. That's right. the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so if they, unless the person resigns and you want to appoint someone else, or unless it's decided or we by that it. person, or, yeah, yeah, or, or we change, or we change it. So I just wanted to toss that out there. I don't like. I said I don't have a lot of feeling either way. Uh, it was suggested by a member of the committee, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll throw it out there. Mr. Chair, I attended several of those meetings when I first got elected, so I could understand it. And then I've met with <laughs> uh, Felisa uh, on, a, um, on issues over the years so that I could understand what was going on on the, on the board. So there's other opportunities without having to change any rules. So. Uh, look, I, I, the time that I've served there, and I haven't served that that long. I mean, it's been, to me, it's important there's a lot of continuity on that board. I mean, the, the chairman, I think, has been there for a few years, and most of the members have been for a, there for a few years. It's, it, although it seems like a sort of like not a very important board, it is, and it's very complex. It is a very, you know, very data-driven type situation. So I, I think while the idea may be good to rotate to get some new leadership, the opposite of that is that to, be, to relearn every year the process to calculate these things, it's really a, a complex a complex board. I, I'd say that what we need to do is then, you know, if we want a, a board, another board member to serve, then we appoint them for three years. I think it's enough time for them to get, you know, acquainted with the system and uh, and not have to relearn and re reset everything else. It's, it's, it's been a great experience. And some of the people that have been there have been there for a while, but it does, it's not a simple board to serve on, let's put it that way. Right, that is correct, because each board member has an expertise in their field. So we have someone who has an expertise in the financial component, someone in the medical insurance, as well as someone within the um, um, medical side. So we have a representative from... No, I, I think, I, and I think the issue was more like allowing some of the other board members to get familiar with that. And maybe what we need to do is we need to have the, the representative to that benefit trust, you know, sort of give a presentation to the board or explain a little bit what's going on anyway. Even if we go into a cycle of letting a new board member serve, we can, you know, do that by, you know, on our own. I mean, well, yeah, some particular point like I, said, I, I mean, I, I'm not looking for it. I've got enough to do. I just <laughs> told this individual I would pass that out there. Well, don't worry about it. I so. wasn't going to vote for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, that's ongoing, fine. Um, I just move that we approve number seven as presented. Is there a second? Second. Uh, no, I wanted Mr. Simmons to vote. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were looking at just it. She's not going to say anything. I'm like, no. Okay, there's been a motion and a second to approve item number seven as presented. Anybody else? Any more discussion? There'll be consequences for any more discussion. <laughs> <laughs> well, those in favor of the motion signify by stating aye. All aye. right. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Even though Thanks I know we could have done much better. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> Such is life. Just because you're the chairman of the uh, association. Yeah. Oh, he's going to pay for this. You <laughs> remind me of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to go to the planning and zoning agenda. Uh, full legal description of property sites for all rezoning cases are available for public review at the Yuma County Board of Supervisors Office. Uh, we have expedited rezonings and public hearings. Uh, these items will be open as a group of public hearings and acted upon by one motion to adopt the recommendation of the Planning Zoning Commission, except for any item that is removed by a board member for separate consideration. That item will be discussed and acted upon separately following actions on expedited items. I think we have one, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Three expedited items, which normally means they've gone through the process. There really isn't any opposition. They have met all the requirements, and we can simply take them on. Uh, in you know individually or in a group and normally we could do it in a group and save ourselves some time unless one a board member has any concerns and then we can pull it out and separate it's sort of like a consent agenda for the planning and zoning commission so anybody wants to pull any of the items if not then i'll entertain a motion to approve them as presented mr chairman so, yes this still has to be open for public hearing oh, yes public hearing uh -huh. oh yeah it's an expedited resort 
Okay, I'm gonna open up all three items for public hearing. Um, you know, we don't really want to have, unless unless a public member here wants uh, to open up the item, we won't, you know, go through the whole presentation, but you know, it's up to you. Uh, anybody here in the public that would like to address any of these particular items? And I always say, remember when you're winning, you don't do anything to mess that up, right? So everybody's settled. I'll close the public hearing and move back to the regular agenda. Um, is there a motion to approve the expedited items as so presented? Moved. Is there a second? I'll second. There's been a motion and a second to approve items one, two, and three of the expedited calendar and the agenda. Uh, all those in favor, uh, any discussion? No discussion. All those in favor of the motion signified by stating aye. 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 Anybody opposed? That proves those items. Uh, we now move into rezoning, which is the regular public hearing items. Uh, and this one, staff will make a full presentation on each of the following items, followed by a separate discussion, a public hearing and action by the Board of Supervisors. We have one item. It's from Development Services Planning and Zoning Division. It's a commission initiative, case number 1801, um, a proposed text amendment to the Yuma County Zoning Ordinance, section 401.00. Manufacture home permits, section, section 801.03, which is the sign area, section 1102.02H, setback exemptions, and section 1108.09, swimming pools, hot tub, jacuzzi, and pool mechanical equipment. That sounded real sexy there at the end. <laughs> Go ahead, Maggie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this item was brought to you uh, back in October uh, of this year, just as a presentation. Uh, it is a commission initiative to amend uh, several sections of the zoning ordinance. Uh, it's up to you whether you want a PowerPoint presentation. The text for the uh, changes to the zoning ordinance are uh, contained within the staff report. Uh, the slides all only indicate the strike and bold uh, changes that are proposed. Um, the item was presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission on um, October 22nd, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval. And uh, this item is before you for a public hearing today. Okay, does, uh, does any of the board members want to, you know, get go through the, the uh, presentation or are you, are you informed enough or familiar enough with the uh, items as to be able to go ahead and have a public hearing and then see if there's any questions and comments through there? Um, yeah, I don't think so. I don't have anything. Okay. Let, let's open it up to the public and see if there's anyone in the public that wants to uh, ask any questions about it, although we really haven't, you know, done much. Uh, is there anyone in the public here interested in uh, talking about the text amendments? Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm out there, but um, <laughs> I'm going to move on. Um, I'm going to close the public hearing on this and take and bring it back to the board. I mean, again, we've had this before. It's just a matter of, you know, finishing it up. Uh, it's gone through planning and zoning. It's been approved by planning and zoning. We have discussed previously what the changes would be. So if you don't have any questions, I'll entertain a motion to go ahead and approve the commission initiative case number 1801 as, as proposed. I do have one question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Maggie, the part about the uh, location of spas or tubs within five feet of a, a lot line, I, that does not include the equipment, I assume, correct? Correct. Yeah, okay. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, if not, I will entertain a motion to approve Commission Initiative Number 1801. I'll move, Mr. Chairman. Is there a sec second? Second. Motion and second to approve Commission yeah. Initiative 1801 as, as presented <clears throat> or as proposed. Any comments? No comments. All those in favor of the motion signify by stating aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Maggie. Um, now, the next item in the agenda is event calendar and current events. This is where board members and county administrator will report on or may discuss events attended or to be attended on behalf of the county and may present a brief summary of current events and may update the schedule for future board of supervisor meetings appropriate. No legal action will be taken pursuant to ARS 38-431.02K. I'm going to open this item uh, by asking Supervisor Pancrasi when she gets off the phone. I was to, just texting uh, Lisa. Okay. To open to start the presentation of her items because she's always you know she's always lead us into this. I okay. Didn't, until I looked over, I didn't realize that we should have started on the left. This. That's okay. Oh. I'm ready. 
Um, I, uh, I attended the uh, Yuma Chamber Legislative Affairs meeting and uh, presented them with um, all of the, thanks to Robin, with all of the information um, regarding the new legislature and where their committee of chairs are and committees that they're on and uh, some of the upcoming um, issues that we might see in the legislature. And then Monday, I uh, attended the uh, Agribusiness Roundtable, and I always learn something new when I attend that meeting. Um, I went to the Historical Society's Christmas gathering. Um, I was in Phoenix and met with Ted Vogt, along with uh, Greg Wilkinson and Lowell Perry, uh, as a member of the Heritage Area Board, um, the previous uh, parks director who is no longer with us had promised us some money so we were going up there to see if we could uh, uh, get that money and uh, and we had a very very good me meeting and it was very productive um, i attended the medium county caucus uh, meeting and uh, turned over the helm to jean bishop uh, of mojave county and then I attended the CSA Board of Directors meeting, and it was Russell's very first meeting. He did an excellent job. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I judged the science fair at Yuma High School, and uh, I'm always so amazed at how smart our kids are. And then um, I attended my National Heritage Area Board meeting, and I attended the Summerton uh, Tamale Festival, and of course, I served on grand jury again this week, so. <laughs> oh, you didn't do much this month, this two weeks, huh? <laughs> All right, uh, Supervisor McLeod. Yeah, I attended the uh, CSA board meeting. Uh, I guess, judging by what I saw in the video, I owe somebody lunch. Thank you very much, it was very kind. Uh, also, uh, of course, attended the uh, ACO conference where our very own Robin Poquet was uh, elected president. So congratulations to her. Look forward to uh, working together with her and having a very productive year. And uh, it was a very interesting time. It's the first time I ever spent a week at a hotel without a room key. Nobody had a room key. And uh, so it was a very interesting time. You had to be escorted to your room. Uh, or that wouldn't be the first time. Like me, I uh, just left my door unlocked the whole time. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, that's too much oh. detail. Hi. <laughs> Keep going. Huh. Well, luckily, I still have my clothes. Oh, okay, good. That's all I have. All right. Chairman. Supervisor Simmons. Uh, see, I attended the Yuma Fresh Vegetables uh, luncheon slash uh, conference, I guess you'd call it. There was a, uh, a gentleman from back east that uh, was very uh, informative as far as the equal eye and the issues that that uh, brings to uh, produce. But uh, like I said, it was a very interesting um, conference. Also uh, attended the Welton Library's anniversary um, Saturday. They were having their 10th anniversary, I believe it was, for their opening. Also attended uh, library programs at Summerton and Dayton and Mohawk. Um, LEPC meeting, attended a retirement board meeting up in Phoenix with two or three of the other uh, uh, board members um, talking about changes that are coming for public safety retirement and Corp and EOR. So, uh, we had that. Uh, Reads Across America, I was honored to read the proclamation and lead the uh, pledge Saturday out at uh, Sunset Vista um, Cemetery and uh, attended the Town of Welton tree relighting as well. Supervisor so Porsche? Um, I attended um, ACO conference, which is my first time there, and there was a good, good conference. I learned a lot. And then I also attended the YMPO meeting last Thursday. I was afraid to mention that I attended the benefit trust meeting because, uh, you know, I didn't bring up that issue <laughs> up again, but uh, you know, okay, I did. Russell, you uh, yeah. I will find out who talked to Mr. Lass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Susan, you go ahead and give your report. Yeah, right. Good morning, Chair and members of the board. I also attended the ACO conference, and it uh, it does have a lot of really good educational sessions as content, as well as the, the summit awards and um, the swearing in of the new uh, board. So that, that was very informative and enjoyable. Uh, I also had our city county administrators bi-monthly meeting. It was held in San Luis, and uh, we talk about it 
areas of interest and where we can work together and anything that we can support one, our, one another on in the legislative session coming up. I attended the CSA medium county caucus as well as the board meeting this month uh, for the CSA supervisors. That's it. Well, I was in Washington, D.C. for a week, so I'm trying to forget that portion you know, during the whole week. <laughs> I was attending a housing, uh, affordable housing conference during the week, and, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was a particularly different time than, than years past, the past, but still pretty interesting, um, you know, so I spend the week there, and some of that, it's forgettable. <laughs> but, uh, oh, I might mention also the general session presenters at the ACO conference were excellent. Good job. They, they did a really good job. Really good. Enjoyable. All right. Okay. Uh, that takes care of that item. And we're going to move right into a work session. Uh, Which gives five so we can see this thing. Where? It just gives five. Oh. Five minute recess. Uh, this is a half hour, but you know, half hour meeting. We need a five minute recess. Huh? So we can call the legislators in our turn. Oh, okay. They're going to try to, I guess they never figured out we moved so fast through meetings that he's going to, you know, we're going to make some calls to see if we can get some other people attending. Is this the format we're going to use? Uh, yeah, if I could just kind of give a little overview. Uh, what we'd like to do is have the legislators sit up here so that we can get the, the microphones uh, for them. And as they want to speak, just press the button in the middle. So we'll have your name plates up here. And then the rest of us will be in this in the um, mm -hmm. seating area, and we will have CSA and ACO can sit at the table. We'll have microphones there as well. All so right. We so what we're going to take is not it's a five minute. We're going to take a ten minute recess to reset because you know we keep saying minutes, but it'll take us a little longer than that. So we'll reset the room for that. Uh, and let me talk. Let me just open that up. It's a county administration review of 2019 legislative proposals for the County Supervisor Association and the Arizona Association of Counties. The legislative roundtable was intended as a forum for discussion and identification of mutual interest and support for the upcoming Arizona legislative session, the Yuma County Board of Supervisors and other county officials, representatives of CSA and not NAC, ACO, and state representatives and senators have been invited to participate. So, okay, we'll take a 10 minute recess to reset yeah, the room.
Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to call this uh, work session in action. I am back into, uh, into session. We took a brief recess. Uh, that, that's uh, brief is just the, the way I describe it, but we have uh, we had a recess and we're now uh, on our item uh, for discussion in action and it's a review of the 2019 legislative proposals for the county supervisor association and the arizona association of counties uh it's a legislative round round table uh, it's just for discussion and identification of mutual interest and support of the uh, or for the upcoming arizona legislative session uh, this is the Yuma County Board of Supervisors and other county elected officials and representatives of CSA and ACO and state representatives and senators, you know, who have been invited to participate are here. I want to begin the meeting by thanking everybody for taking time from their busy schedule, especially farming, which is so unpredictable. And Senorita, uh, you know, I'm going to ask everybody to introduce themselves because uh, just that example, you know, it's enough for me to realize that I'm going to mangle most of the names. And so I'm going to ask the elected officials and, and the, the guests, everybody, to please introduce yourselves. I think most everybody here, you know, we know each other. But just in case, uh, let's begin by having Lisa start. Senator Atondo, please. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. I'm Senator Lisa Otondo from Legislative District 4. Good morning. I'm Representative Charlene Fernandez. Good morning. I'm State Senator Sina Kerr from LD13. Good morning, uh, Representative Tim Dunn from LD13. Glad to be here. Uh, John, we always have to have legal here. You know, <laughs> I don't. We've gotten in trouble in the past, I guess. Good morning, John Smith, Yuma County Attorney. And I guess you're going to have to come up here because the cameras don't zoom. So. Good morning. Robin Stallworth Poquette, Yuma County Recorder and President of Arizona Association of Counties. Congratulations and condolences. And condolences. Good morning. Angela Pancrazi Moreno and President of the Arizona Treasurers Association. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Joe Worley, Yuma County Assessor and your Yuma County Rep for the ACO Board. Oh, thank you. Susan, just in case, who knows? Yes. Good morning, Susan Thorpe, County Administrator. Paul, come up. Somebody out there is hiding, but. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Paul Melcher, Director of Economic Development and Intergovernmental Affairs for Yuma County. Thank you. And we have seated in the front here of the accused. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Frank Sullivan, the Supervisors Association. Jennifer Marson with the Arizona Association of Counties. Right, and you have an assistant? Uh, Robin Hilliard with uh, CSA. Okay, that kind of takes care of the introductions. Uh, and we do have a representative of the news media, not the fake media, the real media. <laughs> here, and you know, she's All right, listening. Blake. So, can I have a minute? You can have a minute. Thank sure. you very much. You know, before we get started, I just wanted to thank all of you for the excellent work that you did with the county elected officials last year. Um, I know there, there was a lot coming at, from all directions, especially uh, Senator Kerr and Representative Dunn, uh, who just got thrown into the mix. And uh, But you did some great work last session and uh, were able to relieve counties of uh, basically unfair sweeps uh, and the burdens that were placed on us just to give you a couple data points I've got them written down uh, Yuma County alone our general fund got relief to the tune of five hundred twenty nine thousand dollars so thank you for that we were able to add a quarter of a million dollars to our road program that had been taken from us previously and uh, you know these resources are important to the county's ability to serve our constituents uh, who are your constituents and so you did a great job up there last year. Really appreciate that. Um, I can tell you from serving on CSA's Legislative Policy Committee that the other county representatives were very pleased with the results as well. Uh, it wasn't just Yuma County, but, but uh, in particular, uh, you know, that's obviously what we focus on. But uh, there were about 30 bills in all. And uh, so you folks did a great job of 
representing the county interests and uh, you played a major role in getting that done and I wanted to thank you for that. Supervisor Banker. Um, I'd like to take this time to thank all four of you that are up here and for all the work that you've done on water but I have to um, thank Lisa Otondo. She has attended every board meeting and every subcommittee meeting on the drought contingency um, what's it left? Plan. Plan. Thank you. I knew it. she has attended every subcommittee and every uh, regular committee meeting and um, has worked her tail off um, for Yuma County to prevent um, our water from going somewhere else. So um, I want to thank her for all that time. It was all off session, but um, it's been a lot of work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairs. Uh, Lynn, it's, you know, it has been very, very busy. So there were actually three working groups, plus the uh, steering committee, plus a lot of back room. And I probably put on over 200 hours of phone calls. I've handed out two letters that I sent to the steering committee. Um, one was also directed to CAWCD during the course of this because we ran into some a real perilous period and then an amendment that was definitely not in Yuma County's interest. Um, so uh, I just I wanted to share those with you. Yeah, I'm sure we'll get we'll get to, to talk a lot more about that okay. as we go along. Since we're in the uh, compliment period, is there anything you guys want to say? No, just yeah, I don't want to leave you. Thank out. you, guys. <laughs> All of you, like well, said, yeah. for us. And recognize Senator Kurt for making a long drive today. Thank you. And I understand you have to be back in Phoenix at three o'clock. So, we do. I think the House does this. Oh, the House does. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for making the trip. All right. And who's going to get this thing started? Great. Uh, ladies first. Ladies first. Whatever the chair. Oh, no. Go ahead. Ladies first. All right. Light is green. Is this working? No. No. Okay. I'll stop laughing. Turn it off. Well, turn it off. Super light. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Someone in the back is listening. It's a little old. Like some of us. Okay. I'll just be really close, like a pop star. All right. So uh, my name is Jennifer Marson. I'm the executive director at the Arizona Association of Counties, and I'm going to share with you um, the county government platform as approved by our board of directors at our conference a week or so ago. Uh, we had 12 proposals. We have now 12 proposals. We started with 19, and we've called them into 11 bills. So I think, does everyone have the handout? OK. So please stop me if there are any questions, and I apologize that my back is to you all. Um, so improvements on possessory right. You don't? I don't have the handout. Thanks, John. Okay, I'll give it a moment. Thank you. So when a non-governmental entity constructs real property or buildings on government land or unpatented land, when the assessor's office goes to value that improvement, we, that's called an improvement on a possessory right. And there needs to be some clarification about how these improvements are assessed. And so essentially what this bill will do was require the county assessor to value improvements on possessory rights using a hybrid valuation procedure so that the property is valued using its lim limited property value according to the real property assessment procedure but the assessor places that value on the personal property tax roll because even though the land sits, I'm sorry, the improvement sits on the land the way you would think of a house sitting on your land at, at where you live, the building is owned by a different entity than who owns the land. And so in that sense, it's personal, but because it's on there, it's real. And so that's why the assessors would like to use a hybrid approach. We were very close to getting this bill last year. We ran into a small challenge with the Mining Association. That challenge has been resolved, so I don't anticipate too many issues moving forward with this one in 2019. And Mr. Chair, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, everybody has the, the uh, flyer, for lack of a better word. Is there, are there any questions of any of these things? And you know, uh, do we want to focus on any of them? Uh, I mean, uh, we started with the first one. Um, any questions on the first one? 
Well, uh, yeah, I, Joe, would you explain why it's important? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, members of the Senate and in house, uh, this bill is more of a technical corrections bill. <coughs> Currently under Arizona law, when a uh, personal property bill is issued for commercial personal property, the limited and the full cash value are equal to each other. These are generally improvements that are houses, generally, that are located on federal properties or state properties where the house is uh, owned by the, the tenant, the occupant of the property, the possessor of the property, and of course the, the land is owned by the government. So all we're taxing is the building itself. We need the mechanism to be able to recognize the limited property value calculation as being the same as any other residential uh, calculation. It's more of a technical correction than anything else. So that's why we're looking forward to this. As Jen said, we had a little s small snag last year and we've gotten past that and uh, I think it's ready for, for movement this year. Okay. Thank okay. you. Any other questions? No? Thank you. Oh, thank Tim, you Tim. Questions on the next no, wait, we're going. Tim. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Said it done. Joe, uh, how would that, would this affect like improvements on state land as far as Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Dunn, the state land assessments are already taken care of. This is more for federal property than state. State already has a, a procedure for it. This is these are improvements on federal properties. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Representative Fernandez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Joe, can, what was the bill number uh, last, last year? Last year, I'm not sure. Oh, I'm not sure. And then could probably yeah. tell you. And, the, and also with that, do you know who will be carrying it this year? Not yet. Not oh, yet. okay. Here we go. Representative Fernandez. Yeah. This year. Uh, Representative, that is not in my notes, but I will email that to you later today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Senator All right, Kerr, any other questions? You, Senator Kerr, did you have a question? Yeah. Oh. Maybe I was just adjusting my Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Joe. And if you remain in front here, okay. Sorry. Yeah, he's right. Okay. Um. Okay. The next one is a property tax exemptions, which contains two components, if you will. If you were to read the property tax exemptions in the Constitution, it would it would not make sense. Some of it is no longer accurate, and you would not be able to calculate what kind of uh, benefit you might be getting. So the first component would really establish all of the property tax exemptions in the Constitution in one place, rewrite the legally operative language, because there's a lot that isn't operative anymore, into one full section, and then we would reinstitute a property tax exemption for honorably discharged veterans that because of a court case and the way that the language was worded had to be stripped, although the language still exists in the Constitution, so this would make all of the language that is actually operable in one section and then ask, can we reinstitute this procedure uh, for the dishonorably, um, or not dishonorably, the honorably disabled veterans. And of course, because it's constitutional, this is something that would have to go to the ballot. Uh, we've actually been working with the assessors on this issue for a couple of years now. It always is a challenge putting something on the ballot, um, but it just doesn't make sense to the lay person who's trying to figure out what kind of benefits they may be entitled, what kind of constitutional property tax benefits to which they may be entitled. And so we believe that this cleanup is necessary. Right. Any questions from the elected uh, representatives or? Uh -huh. I have a question. So this will be a referral. M Mr. Chair Representative, that's correct. And do you know at this point who's going to carry it? So um, Representative, um, I'm Mr. Chairman, Representative, so to that point, because our board just approved these proposals last week at our conference, while we have talked to some members of the legislature on a couple of different things, we, wanted, we didn't want to assume that our board was going to approve any certain issue, and so we are just now starting that process. And then you said disabled, but you just meant discharged, right? No, honorably, honorably discharged dis disabled, disabled veterans. Okay. Okay. Correct. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it doesn't, so, and then, can I ask you one more question? Sure. Is it going to be, simul uh, Mr. Chairman, simultaneous sure. in the House and in the Senate where you will run the referral? You mean you two separate bills? Well, it would be the same bill, but running simultaneously so that you can get it done right away. Just checking. 
Mm, I, I, we haven't discussed that yet. In years past, the leadership has not liked to dual do liked to do dual assignments like that. If this leadership is open to it, absolutely. Okay. Any other questions on the property tax exemption? Move. Move to okay, the next one, county elected official salaries. So it has been since 2007 for the superior court clerks and 2009 for the other elected officials. By other elected officials, I mean those that are in Title 11, so not the justice of the peace and the constables. So this salary um, bill proposes an increase for the other eight elected officials, assessor, attorney, clerk of the court, recorder, school superintendent, sheriff, supervisor, treasurer. I think I got them all. Um, those that are in 11419 and 12281. <clears throat> what the board approved is a 28.6% increase for the attorneys and sheriffs who are not tiered. All of the other elected official salaries are tiered based on whether their county has above or below 500,000 people in their county. And then a 22% increase for the other elected positions, not the sheriff, not the county attorney. For Yuma, because you have five supervisors, and this would be effective 1-1 one, one of 21, which is the new term of office for all of those elected officials except the Superior Court Clerk. So in 1-1 one, one of 21, that would be an impact just salary. I didn't calculate retirement costs or anything like that, but just on salary, it's about $190,551 in additional salary costs for Yuma beginning that year. Then in 2023, which is the next term of office for the Superior Court Clerk, you would be adding um, an additional 14036, 14036 to bring the clerks up to, because they run in different, different years. Um, it has been a while, like I said, 12 years and 16 years respectively for the others and for the clerks. We almost had a bill last year and the year before. There were some political reasons two years ago. There were some budget concerns last year, uh, but uh, our board believes that our county elected officials do good work, and I don't think anyone in any sector would go that long without even making the request to adjust their salaries. And so we think it's a, it's a top priority for the association this year. I'm happy to answer questions. No. Any questions from the elected officials? Anyone? All right. Wow, I thought that one for sure. <laughs> Well, it feels a little, it feels, it's okay. it sort of, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it sort of feels a little uncomfortable to ask questions when you're asking. I understand. So we'll move on to the efficiency. Okay, so privacy for constituent email addresses. We'd like to insert a narrow exemption into the public records law to make the email addresses that are in furtherance of the office protected from a public records request. What I mean by that is, for example, we have a lot of assessors who are asking people to opt in. Do you want to receive your notice of value by email? <coughs> That's the email address that would be protected under this narrow exemption, not the, as a constituent, I email the assessor and ask them a question and they're responding to me. That's a direct email exchange constituent to office. That would still be subject to public records law. We tried something like this a couple of years ago. The Newspapers Association was on board. Everyone was on board. There was just a little political snag that hung it up. Um, we have been talking to the Newspaper Association already. They want to see specific language, of course, before they commit one way or the other, but I think that we're going to be okay. We've actually wrapped in the, uh, the treasurer's office as well because there are some things that the treasurer, some treasurer's offices in the state are, again, allowing that constituent to opt into this mass kind of input of data that would come from that office, and so that's the narrow exception that we're looking for. Any questions? Just a comment, Mr. Chairman, for our representatives and Senator. Um, I listened to the conversation on this at ACO, and uh, primarily uh, what this bill would do, right now somebody can do a public records request and then use the database that they've created to market. Right. And so it would not be right for someone to take advantage of that system that people have opted into and then be subject to marketing efforts. And so I would uh, strongly support that. Hopefully that can get mm -hmm. your support. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to know, this also includes like what the county recorder picks up too, right? Um, like for um, voter registration. 
um, the email addresses they pick up there now. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative, at this point, it's just talking about those emails that are collected through the assessor and the treasurer's office. When you're talking about information that a voter provides in their voter file, if you will, that data is already part of the master voter file that the recorder's office shares with people that are legally allowed to have it. And so we would not be pulling it back in that instance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great question. Any other questions on this? No, we'll move on to the next one. Okay, state digital repository system. So here's the challenge. The State Lib Library and Archives has to collect all the data from a variety of different entities. And right now, the law says one of the places, one of the s formats that you have to give it to us is a microfiche. <clears throat> microfiche, I guess, is great, except that the, the machines that you use to read the microfiche cannot be fixed anymore. The, they don't make them anymore, the parts are too old, and so at some point, you're going to be unable to read those records that are only stored in microfiche. The county has tons of data that needs to go to state library and archives. What we're starting with is the data that comes from the Superior Court Clerk's Office. We want to be able to modernize library and archives so they can accept digital records from the counties so that the counties can, A, free up actual space that's being taken up by paper records right now because we can digitize them and then give them to library and archives. We tried something like this in 2014. Our challenge back then was we, we simply needed money from the state. That was not a good year to ask the state for money. The answer was no. What's happening now is the Maricopa County Superior Court Clerk's Office is willing to donate three years worth of funding to get the pilot project started to demonstrate to everyone how valuable this is and how needed it is. And then in year four, we would need the state to come in with some general fund money. I mean, we're talking about like $100,000 a year. It's not a lot of money because technology has advanced in such a way that the kind of gigabytes and terabytes of data that need to be stored can be purchased at a much cheaper cost than it could even back in 2014. So what we're hoping that the legislature will approve this plan so that we can get it started as a pilot project with funding already secured and then move on to implement more agencies and departments throughout the local governments to be able to submit those records digitally to library and archives. Sounds like a winner. Wow. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Sure. Chair, um, we have uh, um, a surplus of money this year and next year. Not really a surplus, but we have we we have more revenue than we've had in the past. Let's put it that way. Do you think it would be better to ask for that money and not do a pilot program, but ask for that money for the counties this year and next year, while we it's one-time funding and that's what they're looking at is things that are one-time funding because um, 2021, 22, mm -hmm. the budget, I mean, it's forecasted that will, the, the revenues will drop again. So, I mean, if we need to get this done, should we not think about doing it while we have a, not a surplus, but where our budget is flush? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, super, I always want to say Senator, Supervisor Ryan Krasi, uh, I definitely think I could make a strong argument either way. I think that, as we know, when we do have anything that looks remotely like a surplus, the line of people who want a piece of that pie is incredibly long, and everyone has a really good reason why they should get some of that money. And, and counties need to maintain some of that in lots of other areas. Um, I know that Craig will kind of get into some of those wins from last year, but those need to be sustained. We can't just be happy about last year. We have to look forward and be happy about future years as well. So. Uh, right now, the strategy that our board wants to move forward with is using that pilot project because Maricopa has the money. But yeah, I could make a good case either way. I think it is a recurring expense, not a one-time. That's what I was going to ask. Do they have any mm -hmm. idea of what the reoccurring expense oh. would be? Uh, I'm told from the, d from the research that Library and Archives has done that it's going to be about $100,000, $125,000 a year once you get to your full capacity of terabytes that you need in order to hold the data, then you're looking at 50 to 75. Oh, okay. So it's not one-time funding. No, 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 no. Uh, I'm sorry. If I said that, I was mistaken. Oh. No, I just I took it. No, that. you didn't say it. I just took it as one-time. Okay. But because we're sort of thinking of it as a pilot project, so, you know, mm -hmm. because it's being done by somebody else, and it's sure. got sort of like an ending, and then it's, so it, it, in some ways it is one-time funding if Maricopa is paying for it. It's one. It's it's three time funding for Maricopa. Let's call it that because they're willing to do it for the first three years. All right. 
All right. So what we're looking at is supporting sort of like a pilot project to see how good it is and then trying to support that to become a permanent. Correct. Because we want to make sure that those records are available in the future for people who want to look at them. That's the whole point of retention and that's the whole point of library and archives. Yes, it is. And I'm sure it's not just uh, those records. I'm sure that most records now that you know are older, they need to be protected. Absolutely. Right. And that's true of every department in every county. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments on this? All right. And we move on then to the next one, expanded settings of four county detention officers serving warrants. So this comes from our county sheriff. So right now, if you're a detention officer and there's someone in custody in the jail that needs another warrant served on them, which happens all the time, a detention officer can serve that warrant, which is great. But let's say that person is in a hospital setting. Let's say they're in court. A detention officer cannot serve in those two instances. And instead, when a warrant needs to be served on those people, we have to pull a deputy off the street in order to be able to do that. Almost every sheriff's office in the state is short right now of personnel. So right now we would like the authority only in the hospital and in a courtroom setting for the detention officer who's already there with the person because they're the one who's doing the transport back and forth from the jail to the hospital, from the jail to the court. So in those circumstances, we would like those DOs to be able to serve warrants as well. Logical. Yeah. yeah. Any questions from anyone? No? All right. Okay, the next one comes from our county treasurer's office. Um, I won't go into the details associated with how a tax lien sale works, but the gist of it is when people don't pay their taxes, then they go to bid, right? And people bid on, on purchasing these tax liens. Unfortunately, what happens in some cases is a person will come in, make a successful bid, which then pulls that tax lien off of anyone else being able to bid on it, and then they don't pay. I'll be in in two weeks. Okay, I just need another week. I just need another four weeks. And then all of a sudden, you have this tax lien that could have gone to the second place bidder, but that is now being uncollected because this, or the winning bidder didn't pay. The treasurers would like to institute a procedure that says, hey, if you win and then don't pay, you don't get to bid on anything next year. You're banned for a year. Ooh. So that makes sure that the county gets the money that they're trying to recoup throughout the tax lien process, and we're holding people to their word. If they say they're going to bid on it and pay, then that's what they need to do. So that's what the treasurers would like to do. Right. Would they consider, you know, people can wait a year and come back and do the same thing two years later. Would they consider a repeat offender to be banned for longer? I'm sure that they would. At this point, they are starting with a year. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to go through all the trouble, you may want to put in the bill that if someone does it, you know, in a period of five years, does it twice, then you ban them for five years. Well, think about it. I, I I'm sure they would be open that. to that. I'm sure they would. All right. Any other questions or comments on this? No, then move on to the next one. Okay, this is also a treasure issue. There are two pieces. Right now, there's just some gray area about what, what can be put into the amount of unpaid taxes, fees, and penalties. Some people are, some treasurers are only putting the taxes, the interest, the penalties, and the charges into the amount that needs to be paid. Some counties include fees as part of that. And there's a debate about what a fee means and should it be included in this master total. The, treasure, the consensus among the treasurers is yes, the fee should be A, clearly defined, and then B, wrapped into that master total of things that people owe the county. So we're going to add some clarity there to make sure of that. And then also, when you, there's a timeline associated with tax liens, right? You buy one and then you got to wait a certain number of years before you can foreclose on them. There is also some gray area about what, what starts the clock. Is it the first certificate of purchase that you were, that the property was issued, you know, seven years ago, or is it the most recent certificate of purchase? Because if you're starting the clock off of the most recent, your, your clock will never expire, right? You'll always have another rolling timeline. And so this will clarify that that, um, no, you can no longer foreclose after X amount of time starts with that first certificate of purchase whenever that occurred and whenever that timeline expires so that there's clarity for everybody involved and there's not always this property just rolling over to another clock, another clock, another clock. Right. Any questions? Mm. No? We'll move to the school district. So uh, I believe it was last year the legislature crafted a law that said... Um, 
a school district can't use the same auditing firm year after year after year. They can have a, you know, a contract for a certain number of years, but you can't just use the same one forever, which sounds great. And it works. That's a great law for Maricopa County. That does not work for most of the other counties. A, auditing for school districts is a very specialized field, and there just aren't a lot of firms that do that, quite frankly. B, there certainly are a lot of firms that do that in Apache County in you know Graham County and so if what the proposal is um, from the school superintendents is if the school district ref receives fewer than three bids from audit companies and assuming that you know one of that their current auditor is one of the three they could retain their current auditor for up to 10 years because there just aren't people in these rural areas to do these kinds of school district audits I do know that um, this is an issue for the auditor community as well. And so they have already been talking to some of, I think they're talking to Senator Gray about this particular issue. So we may kind of be pooling our efforts together because they're already recognizing that the bill that was passed last year is sort of a challenge in rural Arizona. Any questions, uh, comments, Charlie? Um, Mr. Chairman, just a comment. Uh, they do realize that it was a ridiculous bill yeah. and they are already working to possibly kill it. So yeah, join Yay. efforts on that. Thank Perfect. You. Good. Next one, juvenile detention school funding. So the county school superintendents would like to update the statutory funding formula for educating minors in juvenile detention. I think it's been since the early 80s, the last time this formula was adjusted. Uh, the $20,000, I believe, that is allotted right now, you couldn't even get a full-time teacher to work in a regular school environment, much less a juvenile detention environment. We recognize that this is a monetary request, and we are still trying to pull all the data to determine what that actual number would look like, uh, but this is coming from the county school superintendents who, of course, are responsible for education in a juvenile detention setting. Okay. Any comments from anyone? No? All right. Okay. Public safety measures. Public safety. So this is the complicated one. So what the county attorneys have recognized is that when you try to restore someone to competency to make sure that they can stand trial, and you can't, there then is a gap. They can't go to trial because they're not restored, but sometimes there's not enough services or a direct sight line, if you will, of services from the RTC process to what they may need in terms of the next step. So the county attorneys across the state actually have gotten together and what they would like to do is create a new Arizona Office of Public Safety Guardianship that essentially will oversee the treatment of people who are found to pose a threat but unable to be restored to competency. This would allow for placement of these dangerous but non-restorable defendants into the Arizona State Hospital or some other facility um, so that they can continue to get ongoing treatment. Because unfortunately, what's happening now, you have a dangerous person. They can't be restored. They have to be released. They recommit. They're still not restorable. Then they have to be released. Then they recommit another. I mean, then it's just this rolling cycle because there's no place for us to be able to put them. And so, the, there is definitely going to be a monetary cost associated with this as well from the state general fund because we're asking for a new office to be created at the state level to oversee these dangerous but non-restorable defendants. Uh, I'll remind our legislators that these costs have been pushed down to the counties in the past. Okay, so I would hope that you would fight to make sure, make it clear in the statute that it is a state responsibility because these same argument I've used in the past, I know uh, many of you have heard it, but uh, mm -hmm. these people are violating state statutes. They're not violating a county ordinance. That's right. And so it is clearly a state responsibility. And so that's, I think it's a great idea, Jen. That's just the only concern that I have. We've borne these costs before and, and it can be enormous, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, but it is a state responsibility. The other, the other question before you, you know, before you start asking similar questions, is why would you not, you couldn't find a department in public safety that can handle this without creating a separate one? Because it seems to me like once you create a department, it becomes, it yeah. grows. Let's put it you mean once you create a state office? Yes. Once you, well, is it under yeah. someone? Is it a separate entity managed by whom? Well, that would all be new because right now there's a complete gap. 
right? They come into the criminal justice system, let's see through the sheriff's office, right? They're charged through the county attorney's office. We recognize that there's some kind of issue that makes them unable to stand trial at the moment. The county pays the cost of RTC restoration to compensate to try to get them to a place where legally they're able to stand trial. But if we can't get them there, they were arrested for a dangerous crime. What we have to let them go. I, you know, that's okay. The arguments for it are there. I just the question is whether we need to actually whether the legislature will look at creating a whole new department as opposed to finding a department that can handle this by adding. Oh, I see your question. I'm sorry, my mistake. Okay. Um, that leads exactly to what Supervisor McLeod was talking about. Our concern, the county attorneys and the association's concern, is they'll say, oh, that would be an awesome thing for counties to do. Why don't you just do it and pick up the full cost of that? But Mr. McLeod's point is extremely well taken. These are state offenses that they are committing that's getting them into the system in the first place. And to totally absolve the state of having to have the financial responsibility. I, yeah. I was thinking about a state office. Uh, but I can I can follow that logic. Yeah. Uh, supervise. Uh, supervise. Yeah. Uh, Senator Atondo and then. Uh, so I've seen the language that the county attorneys are putting forth, and I would just like to say uh, I've been dealing with some cases um, in the state where the individuals that fall into this category are being released, and those individuals are really putting into peril members of their families' lives because of threats. You know, you're dealing with sort of this <clears throat> hole in our, in our laws where mentally, potentially mentally ill mm -hmm. people are being released into the public. And all research shows that the majority of gun violence comes from mentally ill and to people they know. And I'm uh, looking at this, our staff is looking at this, and, and, I, and I know cases of constituents that this is directly affecting. So thank you for bringing this forward. This is something the county attorneys have been working on for a long time, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and there's really a need, and I, uh, I completely agree with you, Russ. This is this is the state's responsibility for uh, paying for guardianship in these cases. So people's lives are in danger. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Representative Fernandez. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, this kind of begs the question I wanted to ask. I, I think you would probably be able to answer it. Uh, does Yuma County still have, or was, I know they were starting a mental health court? Yes. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Money Chairman. well spent. Mm -hmm. Supervisor talking, Simmons. Money well spent. <laughs> You know, but do we have any idea on the numbers that we're talking about as far as people? Um, and, and if so, it, I can't see it being a, a, a huge, huge amount. I know they're out there, but why wouldn't that fall back underneath the, the Arizona State Hospital or DOC? They've got the facilities and the training to already handle it. I don't know, um, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Simmons, I don't know that it can't. But I think because we're talking about guardianship, as an, an DOC is full custody, right? In a guardianship, legally, there's a difference between a full custody situation and a guardianship situation. Because they're not at the full custody stage, I don't know that DOC is the would be the proper place for that. I, I think you could, I, I've never created a state office before, but I think that you could pull and have a hybrid situation between the state hospital, which is where these folks are likely to be treated, mm -hmm. and DOC in terms of security, but I'm not yet sure how that will pan out. I do have numbers, but not with me. I will get them for you. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I think we all agree that the need is there, yes. and it's, it's just finding a path that you know is receptive to the legislature and it's you know cost-effective, I suppose, that doesn't create more government that ends up for, with us paying for it. Yeah. Uh, so just be careful with that. Uh, other than that, I think we all agree it's something that needs to be addressed in general. Mm -hmm. Representative Fernandez's uh, question, um, if you ever have time, which I know your time is very full this time of year, but uh, I did uh, take advantage to visit the mental health court just to observe. And it's nothing like what you would think, nothing like what I thought anyway. Um, what I found there was the judge making an effort to hold the agencies 
that should be treating and serving these people, holding them more accountable. And uh, so it was great to see that. And it was, these individuals would say why they're off their meds or why they uh, left their housing. And that, that explanation, and the judge would hear it and turn to the providers and say, why are you allowing this to happen? So yeah, you're right, the mental health court, it's, it's a great asset to our community. Well, I got to tell you, Yuma County is a true trailblazer because not only with the mental health court, and by the way, who's the judge for the mental health court? Uh, you know, it it was, um, it's a judge that is no longer, I don't know who the current one is. What's good about it is they, they, they gained oh, that extra. Yeah. John, 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 John would know. <laughs> of course you would know. <laughs> The court hired a special judge, uh, Pam Osmo, to act as the Okay. Uh, well, see, and, and that that's judge right. would become the, you know, have the expertise. I think that's what's so great as as, as time goes on. and But you being a trailblazer um, with your veterans court now that you've started, you know, I know there's another one in Arizona, but you, you know, Air, uh, Yuma has really become a trailblazer oh, you... with addressing these needs. Yeah. Because the <clears throat> needs are different for different people. So thank you. I want to say that. We, we also have a restitution court. Yes. The drug court. Talk about yeah. a fun court to go to. That's <laughs> <laughs> fun. It was Maria Elena. She was Judge Cruz. She, was, she yeah, was, Judge Cruz is. Show me your cell phone. How much do you pay for that? You know, why do you have a cell phone? You're not paying restitution. It's it's remarkable. Hmm. Mr. Chairman, if I could just comment briefly sure. on this proposed sure. bill. Also, keep in mind that a lot of people that are determined to be non-restorable within the 21 uh, weeks or so, or um, it's not necessarily because of mental illness. They could have an organic <laughs> issue or type of, uh, they're incapacitated for other reasons than mental illness and they never become restorable. So it, it doesn't apply to all those cases. It's those particular cases where it's determined and would be determined with proper due process. That the individuals are not only incapacitated, meaning that they're uh, non-restorable and to be determined to be such, but they're in need of a guardianship and you don't have a guardianship setting that you can utilize with your existing resources because you can have a guardianship set up, but those guardians generally don't have the funding to provide the proper care these individuals need and the extensive nature of the care they're going to need. So what this does is it makes this Office of Public Safety Guardianship to serve as the state guardian, much like our Candy's going to get mad if I say this, our public fiduciary does for other types of dependents, mm -hmm. adults. And they would serve as that uh, guardian for purposes of the treatment for these people who have been determined not only to be incapacitated, but dangerous. Right. And the services could be provided through existing use resources that are available through the state. Mr. Chair? Supervisor, is that good? Um, County Attorney Smith, you said some are other than mental health. What kind of other incapacities and dangerous have you uh, low IQs, super low IQs, where they're unable to understand the, the, the nature of the proceedings before them or participate in their defense. Okay. Um, they could have a traumatic brain injury that will never be able to restore or fix, either through medication or otherwise. Okay, thank you. Things Those like are... that. Thank, thank you, you, Jim. Most helpful. And thank you, Jimmy. Um, and that is it? Right? That's it. All right, well, good. Thank you. Well, a lot of common yeah. sense stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Your time, Craig. Oh, not chair. Thank you very much. You can stand up if you want to. Yeah. Stand up. <laughs> Getting a little rickety in my old age sitting down there. Um, <laughs> it's, a lot, it's a lot of sympathy coming from this group. I know. From this one right here. Well, not even. Wait a minute. Yeah, you admit that there's some young ones in this side. Yeah. Yeah. We got to stand Wait a minute. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for this opportunity. And thanks to the legislators for being here and giving me this opportunity, too. Uh, we do have a handout for you that I think all of you have. On the front are our budget asks and on the back of the bills, and we'll go through each of those. But just for the record, I'm Craig Sullivan with the County Supervisors Association, so it won't surprise you that a lot of what we're looking at is the financial side of the county business. Um, so to begin with, uh, Mr. McLeod, you mentioned that uh, last year was a good year, the partnership with the legislature, and it really was there were significant policies put in the state budget that relieved the county taxpayer of financial obligations of the state general fund. And that was reversing a trend that had really been a dangerous and disturbing trend for many years. Mm -hmm. uh, but the executive and many legislators have really started to draw the line on that. 
And so it was very positive. <coughs> uh, that was important because for those of us who have been around a while, we've been going through a series of pension reform efforts with the state which have unfortunately only led to greater costs being borne by the local taxpayer. Why is that? Because those reforms were largely overturned by the courts. And when that occurred, then people had to be made whole and the whole system was impacted that way. Uh, so a big part of what we were trying to do was last year was to address cost shifts, get rid of those, and to solve the EORP problem, which is one of the three pensions that have been a financial issue to mm -hmm. the counties. EORP is the elected officials retirement plan. In the budget last year, we were able to secure every policy change that we wanted. The problem was, is that two of them were only put in as one time. And so what you see on this document is addressing again, those two items that were put in as one time with the desire to make those permanent, make those ongoing. So uh, what are those? The first is eliminating the statutory requirement that counties pay for the State Department of Juvenile Corrections. This policy has been in place for four years. It was always designed as a way to get money when they had a billion dollar shortfall in the first budget that the executive, the current executive had to deal with. For three years running, lawmakers have been providing relief to the counties. Initially $8 million and now in the current fiscal year $11.3 million. So what we have now is a state law that says counties write us a check for this agency and then through DOA you give us the money right back. So nobody says this policy makes sense. It's really just about the financial problem that occurred four years ago. So our desire is just to eliminate the statutory fee, get rid of that. Uh, the counties are no longer obligated to pay the state agency. We continue to pay all of the bills that we do locally. And if there is a desire to look at the state agency, look at reforms, we can do that. But we really shouldn't have a, a statutory financial obligation. You can see in the lower left of the document I gave you what this means to each county. So Yuma County uh, would receive or be relieved of a $344,000 payment. So it's a big deal. And it matters a lot. Of the, you mentioned 500000 or so dollars that came back to the general fund. 344,000 of that was one time in the DJC mm -hmm. fees. So it's important to continue that. Um, that's number one. Number two is, the, is trying to provide some mitigation to the counties from bearing the full cost of the increased EORP liability. In the current budget, there was one time relief provided to eight counties. Yuma wasn't included there. Why was it just eight? Well, when we looked at how the math worked out, with all of the removals of the cost shifts, Maricopa, Pima, Mojave were doing pretty well and had enough capacity, not Mojave, I'm sorry, uh, Pinal, had enough capacity to deal with the EOR problem. The rurals did not, but what, during the budget negotiation, they, there was only so much money available, and so they allocated it to the smaller rural counties. So Yuma County had to bear about an additional $228,000 that we would have liked to have had mitigated for them. So going forward, how do we put in place a policy that makes sense for folks? So if you look in the lower right of the document, there's a few things I'd like to walk you through and then I'll show you what our solution set is. First is the full impact of the EORP increase was 700, is $757,000 to you. So it's a lot of money. So how do we buy that down a little bit? Right, that was the increase. That was the right. increase, not I the full amount. to make that clear to the legislators. Yeah, that was, yeah. Uh, that was essentially the cost of the reform. The cost of the failed reform effort was $757,000. Um, if we just put that on the property tax here, that'd be a seven cent property tax increase, which is a big property tax increase that nobody wants to bear. Um, if we looked at that $757,000 to Yuma County, what does that mean in the state budget if we wanted to look in relative terms? That would be like you all having a $102 million problem. So a $102 million problem for you is like $757,000 for them. So you can get a sense that these are, you don't want that problem. You don't want to deal with that problem. So what we've come up with is a plan that would provide partial relief to 12 rural counties for the increased EORP liability by directly appropriating on a permanent basis $250,000 per rural county. What this would do in Yuma is 
buy down that increase by about 13%. So you'd still be bearing a, a large amount of it, but we think that given that the whole problem was caused by legislative action and court decisions, that we ought to be partners in how we solve this rather than just shifting the full liability to the property tax base and the county taxpayer. In the current budget, there's 1.8 million, 1.6 million allocated to those eight rural counties. Mm -hmm. If we were to do this for 12 counties, the cost would be $3 million for 12 counties. So a small dollar amount at the state, but pretty meaningful across those rural counties. So those are our primary financial asks, and I know nothing in the budget world's ever uh, simple, um, so I do apologize for some of the complexity. Um, but I'd like to answer any questions uh, from the board or the legislators if there how are. Does, how does the uh, the uh, initiative that was passed this last November, how would that impact the, mm -hmm. the way that, that the legislature can handle that? Yeah. So that's, uh, that's a great question. So the, uh, the legislature referred to the ballot and the voters approved a mechanism, a reform to what's called the permanent benefit increase. So that's a good thing. What that's going to do is allow for the fund to get on a sustainable path when it has good returns. The way it is currently, if the fund does well in terms of market returns, a good chunk of those dollars get put right in the base for benefits. They don't go to the solvency of the fund, and it just further degrades it. This provides it's permanent. And it's permanent. Th this provides a sustainable, predictable COLA. So retirees can count on that. But if there are good years in the market, that money just buys down the liability and strengthens the health of the fund. So that was very good that the voters passed that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, just for a little bit of context, when and you know, I remember Jen and I were were, were monitoring the reforms in was it 2013 or that time period. The strength of the EORP fund when the reform bill was going through the legislature was at about 70 percent funded. That's pretty good funding ratio. After all, the court decisions showing it's unconstitutional, and then we had to see what we had to deal with, the fund was 30% funded. So the reforms actually drove the, the, the program almost into an insolvency. Some people say, well, this, you know, pensions are local government's business, but I, I just want to make, make this point. For PSPRS and CORP, you all have siloed accounts. Those are important. Those are ongoing plans. For EORP, it's all run by the state. Every decision that has driven EORP costs has been by the state, and it's actually closed now. So what we're trying to do is just finish, uh, wrap up uh, a problem that will last for 26 years, mm -hmm. but we're just trying to put in place a sustainable way that um, meets that liability. Without damaging the local... Without damaging the local taxpayer. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to reiterate what Craig kind of glossed over. The, the problem that caused us to have a three quarters of a million dollar increase to our budget this year, it was created by the legislature. The legislature created the problem. They put a cap on it where we couldn't contribute more even when we knew that we should for years. Um, so that's why I think it's a very valid ask that the state be a partner in fixing the problem. And in this one, because it's a closed system now, you can actually see, you can actually figure out how to solve the problem, even if it takes a long time, as opposed to an ongoing project where, you know, you can dramatically change. That's exactly right, Mr. Chairman. There's light at the end of the tunnel. We just have to keep moving towards it. And it isn't a train. <laughs> I hope. We, last year during the legislature, I was trying to sell a, um, you know, a formulaic type of approach so that each county would get a formulaic based relief. But there was some reluctance to do that. And I can understand, because then you don't know what your liability is. As appropriators, it's like, well, how much is that going to be next year? You don't know. Uh, so what we came back with this year is, well, then let's just make a transparent, direct appropriation. Everyone knows what they're getting. You can count on it. You know the cost isn't going to increase. And it works for both parties. Hopefully it works Hopefully. for both parties. Charlene, you had a question? Um, Sorry. Yeah, Mr. Ahead. Chairman, Craig, I, could you, um, on the ADJC, it was really compelling I, when, when I saw how many kids actually from Yuma County, that, you know, the amount we were paying. Do you have that? I had it in my, in my file here, and I can't find the it. number of kids mm -hmm. that are in there? Uh, <laughs> they have that? Mm -hmm. 
or at the office or just get it to Okay, I think it it was, very it was yeah, it was no more than like 10 or 11 and we were paying 344,000. I don't even know if it was that high. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, and I think that I mean, the number of kids. That number and it wasn't just Yuma County, but that number was quite compelling for all the other counties and I know that's why Representative Cobb was really caring you know, the water on this one. Is she going to be pushing this this yeah, time again? Yeah, that's, that's okay, a great good. question. Um, we, uh, Ms. Cobb cares a lot about this and has yes. been getting it on the table. And um, yeah, she intends to try to advance it as far as, but as you know, it takes a team to get something done. So we're trying to get her some help. I think Mr. Leach is very receptive to this and he'll be on the Appropriations Committee in the Senate as well. Thank you. Hi. Yes, sir. Tim, you had a question? Oh, yeah. uh, so what is, the, what is the reaction from the other three counties as far as not participating? Great, great question. So uh, as long as the Department of Juvenile Cor Corrections issue is made permanent, then Pima, Maricopa, and Pinal are satisfied with the result. They got out of enough cost shifts to manage the ER liability. If DJC is not made permanent, then they're going to fall short. Too. So that's, that's the prime target for them. Okay, good. Continue. And know that whenever we put a budget package together, I always call it the 15 county solution because I can't put it on a handout unless all 15 counties agree. Mm -hmm. um, so they've, yeah. So they're on board. Yeah, they're on board. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about the budget piece? Um, the, uh, I did want to mention as we go to the bills that we always care about transportation. Um, the county engineers did a report a year ago that demonstrated the massive shortfall in local transportation resources and the ongoing weakening of the HERF system due to just how our, uh, the fact that we've not raised our gas tax and that more people are using fuel efficient vehicles and all that. We still care a lot about that. Thank you for getting DPS out of HERF. Thank you very much. We're able to use those dollars for roads now rather than paying for the state agency. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mr. Simmons? I just have a question here, Craig. Um, with, with all the um, press or the problems that that, that new um, $32 registration fee uh, is causing, and they're looking at trying to repeal that back down to, I think, the original 17 18. or 18 that they were wanting to do, if they do that, is the governor, or are they going to turn around and start looking at HERF again to pull that money to offset, and then we're going to be back where we were, or? Yeah. Probably. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so when we, that, that came through transportation last year, was uh, supported by Senator Worsley and Representative Campbell. I signed on to the bill, too. We had estimated it that it was going to be $16. When it got to the Department of Transportation and they were looking at the actual cost, it was the director in the department that came up with the 32. I know that uh, Michelle Ugente, sen mm -hmm. um, elect, Senator elect Ugente, will be running a bill to, you know, to, to, to pull that. But the truth of the matter is, is that's how come you got your her funds, is because of that. So where they're going to be going completely repeal it you know I I mean we're we're very underfunded when it comes to transportation right now with our roads and everything so I don't know but I do want you to know that that $32 charge was not our idea that came from uh, cost and analysis done out of the Department of Transportation well it was because the legislature didn't want to look like they were the ones setting the fee so they passed it on to the, the well, we, that's, we gave it to the discretion of the director. Because that's what I mean. Right. Well, I mean, and instead and of setting a fee and saying this is what it's going to be, we you decided to pass it on as a way of well, having them make the decision so it wouldn't be a tax. It would just be a fee. Well, Mr. Chairman, and I figured, and you know that, Craig, that's why we're sent up there to make those hard decisions, and we should be making decisions about how much that fee should be. We shouldn't be passing it on to a di director that we don't know how long he's going to be there or who will be there next. So those decisions should come from the state legislature, not from some random director. Although I have great respect for the ADOT director. It's not that I don't trust him, but this is well, our job. And, and what I was just the reason I brought that up is because I know you guys said, you know, everybody was saying the 16 or $18. And then all of a sudden it was twice as much as what right. anybody expected. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, that, 
That was at the that was under Director Helikowski when that was made. But we had sent the suggestion of 16, and according to the calculations that were done um, by Senator Worsley on the numbers they had run, that would that's what the fee would be. Um, but. Yeah, they were given an Let me tell you, I, all of us have heard about it, I'm sure. <laughs> we have heard about it. Even my assistant came in and said, what is this $32 fee? And I was like, oh, I heard you. <laughs> all right, so the, so the focus is what happens if they repeal that fee? And then we end up back and yeah, yeah. with some pressure to come up with money to fund yeah. and the, uh, the, the public, board, uh, public uh, safety department. Mm -hmm. Senator Kerr. Senator Kerr. Oh, Senator Kerr, sorry. I was just going to make a comment on that, uh, the calculation of that fee, Mr. Chairman, Craig. Um, so what I understood was, you know, there was eight point some million vehicles they were taking into account. But That's what right. wasn't taken into account were the vehicle registrations that were multi-year already prepaid right. and then exempted vehicles. So then that drove down the number mm -hmm. to spread that fee because they were mandated by that bill to fund 110 percent so that's my understanding of that mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's totally that's correct. correct and that's that's, that's what's unfortunate is people that can pay for multi-year for their uh, licensing fee are usually the wealthier people so this is you know very much a regressive tax that is hurting a lot of the people that we represent so that makes it kind of difficult but the on the Positive side of this, I always look at the positive side. I did go to the Sun Quarter Transportation Summit. You were there, Craig, right? Okay, thank you. I'm not losing my mind. You were there. <laughs> and it, it was really positive to hear that there are people throughout Arizona that care about transportation and really want to make an effort to somehow raise that gas tax as, as sad as that sounds, but something that we can uh, start putting money back into infrastructure in the state of Arizona. So is that not correct? Absolutely. And to that point, uh, Senator Kerr's point, very well taken, but actually the number of multi-year uh, payers wasn't the larger number. The larger number actually came from trucking, am I not correct? The numbers of exempt from trucking and from other uh, business exemptions. That's where the numbers kept dropping in much larger sizes. And actually, I don't think it would have made it through the legislature if it didn't have the support of the trucking companies and everything else. So I think those. All right, are, yeah. uh, Supervisor mm -hmm. McLeod. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point out that I think you touched on it, but if you look at, look at what happened with the registration fee, we Arizonans are funding 100%, 110% of what it takes to run the Department of Public Safety, but it serves everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the gas tax, if you doubled it, okay, let's just say you doubled it, that would provide the money necessary to run DPS and to maintain our roads properly. Uh, we desperately need that increase. The city does. I mean, you, you drove here. You saw the streets. Um, last year, I think it was a little over a year ago now, maybe when the hurricane hit Houston, I recall there was talk about the refineries and what that would do to gas prices. So I remembered the price of fuel the day I was filling up. It was two twenty nine. It was as high as two eighty nine a couple of months ago. And what was our economy doing that entire time? It was still on an upward slope. A mere and so that was sixty cents a gallon increase. Sixty cents. I I didn't have any employees not make it to work. I didn't have anybody, I didn't hear anybody complaining about the price of fuel, but it was a 60 cent increase just by the market. So the state doing an 18 cent increase is not going to affect our economy. It gets us the money we need and people who travel through our state will help pay for our infrastructure and for Department of Public Safety. So I hope there is a very strong push this year to get it done. We keep kicking the can down the road, kicking the can down the road while our roads are deteriorating. And they are deteriorating to the point it costs us 10 times as much to repair slash replace them than the maintenance. But we don't have the dollars for the maintenance. So it's a big deal and it's time to act. All right. Uh, Supervisor Pankris. The other thing that in that gas tax increase would be some sort of a fee for those people who drive hybrids and electric cars because they're still using the roads. 
and they're still causing um, wear and tear on those roads, even though they're not paying um, as much in, for the gas. So somewhere in there, there needs to be something, uh, if this goes through, there needs to be something for hybrids and, and electric cars. So um, Spoken like a former legislator. And to that, to that point, that is precisely one of the reasons that Senator Wilkins brought that forth was because of electric cars. Um, and uh, also many of the legislatures, as you know, our legislative co which, uh, Republican legislative colleagues have signed absolutely no taxes, um, you know, promissories. So that, that's a difficulty. But then for the uh, Democrats, it's difficult because a gas tax is a regressive tax. So you've got members on both sides of the aisle who have difficulty, but that's not still addressing the issue as we need to fund the construction and maintenance of our road system. And our well, when you do it through the gas tax, everybody who travel here and use the infrastructure are helping to pay. That's right. So it's the wisest form. Because what you have right now, you've got the entire burden is on us, yeah. your yeah. constituents. So I think um, I think, you know it's just. I think your points have been made. Uh, supervisor, I mean, supervisor, I keep saying, <laughs> Representative Fernandez. Uh, real quick, I, you know, I don't want to belabor the point, but I think the one thing we have to make sure is whether we raise the gas tax or not, that we don't sweep funds anymore. Hello. Because exactly. if we can raise it Amen. to what it should be, and it's then it'll get swept, and you'll never see it here in Front County or any other county. <laughs> oh, well, to the. No, here. no sweep. One other thing. You. To the uh, yeah. point of Supervisor Pancrazy, um, there is a very good uh, idea that is, is within ADOT, okay? Uh, as part of the Flynn Brown Fellowship this past year, I worked with a group of individuals. Uh, one of the guys was with ADOT, another one was with the Office of Budget and Management. Um, created a nice plan that is a per vehicle mile driven. Oh, yeah. It's reported that your annual registration and then uh, when the vehicle is sold, the new buyer has every incentive to correctly report the mileage to the state because then they would have to pay per mile taxes if they didn't for someone who cheated. So it's a, I think the plan was very well put together. If you want to uh, get a look at that or if you want to, uh, if you're looking at it, I can get that information to you. But uh, it's a pretty solid uh, way to get those who are not paying fuel taxes to pay their fair share. Wait. All right, hold on, hold on. Would hold trucking on. also pay it? So. Right, hold on. Supervisor Simmons? I just wanted to add, too, I was sitting there looking at a thing this morning. They were talking about Mississippi, where they had to close 500 bridges because they were in such a state of disrepair in the rural areas. And it ended up costing somebody their life because emergency responders couldn't get the most direct route. So, yes, you know, I'm not, you know, like I said, we not need there, to yeah. concentrate on our transportation, but, you know. All right. So I guess most everybody's had a chance. Uh, Senator? Yes, I just wanted to make a quick point. I believe in fiscal year for 2019 or 2020, we fully restored her funding. And then also the latest JLBC report showed that we are... 9.2 million above forecast of that her fund. So just a little bit of good news on that front and wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You for the good news. Uh, we better move on to the next one. Yeah, a couple. Uh, so on the back, so those are all the budget stuff and I did want to mention transportation. We do have a series of bills that we're taking forward um, and I'll cover a couple of them and then uh, tap Rob in to explain the hard ones. The um, first one I'd like to share with you is juvenile dependency. The issue that was brought to us by the counties is that when the Department of Child Services reforms occurred, 2014, there was a lot of money put in the system to deal with the backlog, get kids into the system who needed to, uh, to have their cases dispensed with. What was not funded were the costs to the counties to provide representation to the children and the families at the local level. And so that cost quite a bit of money and we've been watching that over time and we've seen the caseload spike and it's continuing in several counties. So what we're trying to do is to bring some resources to the problem so we can provide some relief. And what we're looking at is a 
in a, an indigent defense grant program that used to be in place for the counties and has subsequently been swept to DPS. So it's still in place, goes to the Criminal Justice Commission, goes to DPS. It's about $750,000. What we want to do is redirect that back for its intended purpose to defray the costs of uh, indigent defense locally, but in particular, catch up this problem of dependency representations. Um, so we'll be- What was that amount again? $750,000, so I get the number right. And know that when the dollars were swept, there was some money for county attorneys, there was some money for the indigent defense. The county attorneys got theirs restored, and probably the year after it was swept, yes. if I recall correctly, and we've still been working to get this back. So it's a, it's a way of really implementing a prior practice for its intended purpose, and we're able to use it to defray some problems that we're having in the counties. Um, we are working on a sponsor for that now. We spoke with Ms. Cobb about it. She had a few ideas that, that we'll try to work through. The next one I wanted to speak to uh, before I turn it over to Robin is rural transient lodging tax. The rural counties have wanted to have a transient lodging tax to invest in tourism promotion uh, for several years. And with the proliferation of Airbnb and all this kind of stuff, it really creates a nice opportunity to create a program or collect revenues for better economic development promotion. I'm not sure this is going to come to you because Prop 126, which bans service taxes, we think this gets tied up in that. So I'll just leave it at that. Robin and I are meeting with some folks to see if that is the case, um, but we think that might not be actionable this year. And then the bottom item is related to groundwater advisory councils, and this goes right at the issue that we're having in La Paz and Mojave County. This is not a Colorado River issue. This is a groundwater issue. And what's happening in those two counties, they're unregulated areas, as you know well. Uh, there's constituent angst about what's happening with groundwater pumping. And when we go to DWR to say, do we have any data to confirm or deny what's occurring, the data doesn't exist. So the idea here is to get a work group together, a statutory work group of the water users, mine, mines, agriculture, the cities and just get everybody together and have a local con uh, conversation. Why do we want it in statute? Because it'll elevate the conversation and the recommendations that they bring out would still have to go before all of you. So it doesn't regulate anything, it creates a conversation. And Ms. Cobb is going to run this bill for Mojave and La Paz, and it is only for Mojave and La Paz. Yes. Okay. I, Senator Zatoni? And I just want to add to that not only is it unregulated, it's unmonitored. Right. So how do you manage anything that's not even monitored? And I think that's something that a lot of ground, uh, different areas will be facing uh, with the uh, with the water and groundwater crisis that Arizona is facing. So. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to cover those three, um, but the next two probably will make their way to the legislature, and I want to have Robin brief you on those. Oh, for the next two, um, oh, dilapidated yeah. buildings. Uh, I have that. I don't think it is. For. Is that you, Russell? No, is that you, Russell? Yeah. Uh, for. There's some Christmas spirits going on out here. Oh. <laughs> trying to define who's, who's playing what. So hey, everybody looks at each other. Who's. Yes, you've got him looking at Who's huh? playing the Christmas thing? Uh, anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry about that. It's yours, isn't it? Yeah. It's not a phone. No. My phone did not make that noise. Oh. <laughs> My tie hey, did. Oh! <laughs> I leaned forward. And it's high. Oh, it's a tie. It's a tie. It's a tie. Yes, and I accidentally somehow activated it. <laughs> oh, I, it's not that much of an accident, if you tell me, but. <laughs> That's cute. It's not okay. Much. It's got a, you know, a Christmas tie. I don't want to hear it again. <laughs> no, 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 no. I started to think I'm really imagining things. Maybe I'm hearing things. Uh, go ahead, sorry. Uh, so I, in unincorporated areas of counties, um, we have the ability to tear down a building if, it ha if it's dilapidated. So if it's in jeopardy of catching on fire or the, it's structurally unsound, um, we've s run into some situations where we need a little bit of clarity on addressing buildings with extreme sanitary issues. 
um, and the county is unable to determine whether or not there's a structural soundness issue. So we're going to seek clarification on that. Um, in addition, in those situations where we're remediating a property, sometimes there's vehicles on site. Um, in some cases, it's a junk vehicle, and you know, there's, it's really just can be put to salvage. We'd like the ability to call out um, junk removal teams, uh, just like we do today on um, public rights of way and things of that nature. Um, and if it is a vehicle that's still in fine operating order and we would be able to remove it, store it off site, and then bring it back um, after the remediation is done just to ensure that any heavy equipment or anything like that that's on site wouldn't damage the vehicle. Um, so that's the dilapidated buildings. And then on county burials, so part of the county's responsibility is to um, bury individuals if they have no next of kin or their next of kin is unable or unwilling um, to provide those services. Um, in the case that an individual had real personal property, we'd like the ability to place a lien on that property um, and to recoup some of our costs in those situations. <coughs> and those are really the, the two. Yeah. All right. Any questions on those two? Um, Supervisor Bankrin. Mr. Chair and Robin, the money that we recoup off of the county burial costs wouldn't, um, we wouldn't be realized until that property would be sold, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Tim? No? Any questions? All right. Is that uh, the extent of the presentation from both associations? Uh, what, are there any questions from the board to the presenters? Any questions from the elected officials back there? If not, then what I'd like to do is listen to what you have to say and to tell us how we can help you do some of these things, if there's anything, or if this is just too, you know, too broad of a presentation and you need some details, I just want to make sure that you know that you can count on us to support any of the efforts to, to you know, to support, you know, and pass this, this legislation. So, and I think you know you have the assistance of both the chairman of the CSA and the chairman of ACO. <laughs> so, you know, and the minority leader and two senators and, you know, it's, there's a lot of representation in this room. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you just make sure that you know that we're, we stand ready to help with anything you need from us. All these bills are important to us. They were all discussed in a, in a group setting, which just so happened to have happened in Yuma this time for the CSA. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty well informed about what they are and I stand ready to help you in any way we can. And now, before we close the meeting, and give you an opportunity to say anything you want to. Otherwise, and you can insult the vice chair. So. <laughs> Senator Kerr. Senator Kerr, you will begin Go, with Okay, I would, I would just say yeah. that you know, there's a lot of bipartisan issues that we'll be able to solve, I think, this, this session. I think uh, we'll look at the wording, the details of the actual bills when we get to make sure that we have to keep that dialogue going. But I do know you, Yuma County will be very well represented. I'm sure we'll hear from the two, two association leaders. Association and leader. I think, you know, we did it. You know, it's one of the things I worked on last year, just being there appointed, uh, trying to make sure we understood what was going on. And so I think we're going to have a, it's not going to be an easy session, but I think we'll be able to work on a lot of these issues and get them done. No, we're going online, line. Senator? Um, Senator I Kerr? just wanted to, to add to that. As a new legislator, I can't tell you how important it was and how helpful it was to have C CSA come. You know, the information you provide, it's clear, it's concise. There's collaboration. We know clearly what the what the counties are needing, where we were, where we need to be. So thank you so much for that because it helps me make a, a more informed decision. And and so I just really appreciate uh, your organization and, and how you, you bring that information uh, to us. So thank you. Hi. Mr. Fernandez, hold on, oh, hold oh. on, Lisa. Oh, no, I didn't know. Oh you're, oh, you're coming down the line, OK. Oh, um, I well, I, I think you already know we, ha we do have a rural caucus that we are all part of, and, and it really addresses all the issues that obviously affect Yuma County and counties that look like us, right? And um, what's important is during those, those caucus meetings, we talk about the bills and how it will affect our caucuses. So please reach out to us. Um, we meet. Once a week, is that how you guys are going to run it? Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, Tim is taking a big lead on it, and I really appreciate that from him. And I think it is very bipartisan. The caucus looks very much like, like you do right here. Um, you know, the, the issues that are facing the legislature are very much the issues that are facing you. You know, uh, revenue is, is doing really well, except the revenue is not there for us to use. Um, we, there is a surplus, a one-time surplus of about $933 million that everybody is standing in line. Um, a lot of it, I think, would go to public education because we owe them about a billion dollars. Um, after that 933 million, there's a projection of over 200 million ongoing uh, in addition to. So we're kind of looking forward to, to see you know, who, who jumps in front. Um, we're excited about what our legislature looks like. Um, our house is 2931, so Tim is right. And I'm sure Sini feels the same way as Lisa does just looking over at us, is that we will have to work together. We will definitely have to work together. And you've got really good representation there. Um, so we count on you to tell us, you know, this bill is going to hurt Yuma County. This is what we need. This is how you'd li we'd like you to proceed. Um, we hope that when you're in the Phoenix area and you're at the Capitol that you'll, you'll reach out to us. We love seeing you there. And, um, you know, I do. I reach out to CSA all the time. They're there for us to give us guidance. and. Thank you for having this. It was really helpful for, to me. I live here. I live in this community. I pretty much know what's going on, I think, until I you know, watch some of these videos that you guys are putting out there. This is wonderful, being here early this morning to see that video and to know that my constituents can see that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Senator Tondo. <laughs> Oh, when I didn't, oh, when I didn't raise my read. hand, that's right. <laughs> okay, uh, first of all, um, I just uh, want to say, you know, not only is there a lot of leadership in this room amongst our treasurer and our and our um, county recorder, and um, but there's a lot of leadership right here uh, on amongst Board. us. So I just thought it would also be helpful if each of us let you know what committees we're on. So um, next session, I'm ranking in water uh, and agriculture. I'm on transportation, and I'm also on appropriations. Oof. Oh, and I'm a, a minority whip, co-whip. And at the House, because we're 2931 and I'm in leadership, I'm the new minority leader as of January, well, January 14th. Um, so I, I only am allowed to serve on one committee. Uh, this is my third year on appropriations, and um, I'll continue to be on JLBC, hopefully, and JCCR, and House, um, I don't know if I'm going to be in House Ethics or House Administration, but I can serve on those committees, but I can't be on a regular committee other than appropriations. So thank you, Lisa. Go ahead, Sini. And I'll be serving as Chair of Ag and Water, Vice Chair of Natural Resources and Energy, I will be serving on transportation, and in this new session, it will be transportation and public safety instead of, uh, what was it before, technology. And then I also will be serving on appropriations. Oh. <laughs> Those are so great I'm, committees. Uh, appropriations. I'll be the chair of the Ag and Land Committee. I'm going to be the vice chair of the Energy and Water, uh, be on Ways and Means, and on State and International Affairs and trying to help organize the rural caucus with the bipartisan support. So we'll be busy. Wow, it's, it's impressive yes. the, the amount of leadership that's in this room. And we do get a booklet, right, after a few yes. weeks. Yeah. We do get a book with all your addresses. And, Absolutely. Okay. You'll be Supervisor. Uh, I, I'd like to ask if you would care to let us know if there are priorities that you personally have for this session and how we might be able to help you with that. I can tell you our, the priorities for our caucus, obviously. Um, we've been working really hard together about what our priorities are. And one of them is public education. We have to make sure that, we, we, uh, that the funding is where it should be for our, our um, teachers and our students throughout Arizona. Um, but very, very foremost on all of our minds, and especially after going to that summit, is transportation and how we fund it and how we make sure that the money is there, you know, we're not the only ones that are needing money for roads, um, for bridges, as you talked about. You know, a bridge falls down and we put it right back up, like the one in California, and we spend twice as much money getting it back up. We need to be proactive. 
But we also know that when we do put money into infrastructure, we're putting people back to work. You know, when you start building roads and, and you know, sidewalks and lighting and all those things that we need, you're putting people back to work. So we're going to be working very, very hard on workforce development, transportation, public education. And then first and foremost is water, because water is our lifeline. If we don't have water, especially for, for an area like Yuma County, where agriculture is a billion dollar industry, Tim knows that. And um, so, you know, we're working hard on the water issue. We have an op-ed. Um, one of our caucus members wrote an op-ed that appeared in the Arizona Republic today that we need to act on the DCP today. January 31st is a cutoff date, and we need to really um, make sure that we're on it, that it's bipartisan, um, because water is not a partisan issue. So we have to make sure that we work in a bipartisan way. So that's our caucus um, overview. So I wasn't finished when I asked everybody, so I would like to talk about my priorities there for a second. Hey, welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so uh, when before we started talking about that, one thing that I have focused on for over a year is water and the DCP. And what must be in the budget is $30 million that the governor has also said that he will put in his uh, budget for the drought contingency plan. Um, at CRUA, the Colorado River Water Users Association, where both uh, Senator Kerr and Representative Dunn attended in Las Vegas just the last couple of days, uh, Brenda Berman from Reclamation pretty much slapped Arizona in California's hand and said, by the 31st of January, you will have your plans or we will step in. And it's something I've been saying for a year that the feds would say to us is either you do it or we'll do it for you. Um, what Arizona is facing as far as water is crucial. It's crucial and it is the issue. It is the issue. DCP is a seven-year band-aid. It's a seven-year band-aid. Looking at tier one hitting in 2020 and two tier hitting in 2022. If you don't know what that is, I suggest you go on to ADWR or CAWCD's website. So it is the issue. Also, uh, as far as budget and appropriations are concerned, I'm so glad look at three of us on probes. Uh, we've got the teacher salaries. Uh, Representative Fernandez is right. Education still needs more transportation, but we've got, there's probably going to be a companion bill with the DCP resolution. The DCP will come down in the form of a, a resolution. There will probably be a companion bill asking for infrastructure for Pinal County. That will be interesting to see how the legislature reacts to that. Um, but uh, I, I imagine that there's going to be a $15 million ask for that. So as you go down and you start checking the asks that uh, are, are going to be presented, they're already long and uh, and expensive so we'll see how the legislature turns out so anyway all right well you know wait as far, the, oh, okay. as far as i am concerned yuma county has always had a reputation of having high quality people represent them in the legislature i just want to tell you that this is one of the best groups i've seen and i've been around for a long time so you know you guys are really making us proud the, the way you you handle yourselves and the way what you've done it's been incredible for us to witness. So we just want to tell you that, you know, all of you, uh, you. you know, represent Yuma County so well. And the fact that you serve in so many committees and that you are in so many positions of leadership, knowing how dominant the, the, the legislators from Maricopa County and Pima County sometimes get, it's, it's really encouraging to see and it's really a pleasure to have you. Okay. Now, you were going to say something, Ms. Francis? It, uh, next. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your, your kind words. It is an incredible honor um, to get to serve in this capacity. My first time in public service, and, and I'm, it's just uh, very humbling and, and just a great honor and privilege to get to represent part of Yuma County and, and part of Western Maricopa County as well. So I just want to reiterate also the critical um, 
importance of our water and the DCP. And um, as Senator Otondo mentioned, uh, Representative Dunn and I just returned from the Colorado River Waters U User Association meetings. Very informative, very helpful. And Arizona is the only state that requires legislative action. And so, uh, and I think it's been wonderful that we've had the steering committee with, I think, over 30 members. Senator Otondo sits on that. And <clears throat> I think that's been critical to have everybody at the table, all this input. It is so complex. And it's just, I can't overstate how important to get every piece correct. It's like that Rubik's Cube. You move one portion and it, and it affects uh, you know, another portion somewhere else that you didn't even think about. So that, that will be um, uh, a clear priority. Also, uh, fiscal uh, responsibility and, you know, making sure that we're good stewards with, uh, with that surplus of funding that we have and, and meeting the critical needs of the states and, and being good stewards of that on behalf of the taxpayers. And then to reiterate transportation as well, those <laughs> issues and, and always education. So thank you. Thank you. Tim? Yeah, I would just, uh, same thing, the water. We're going to be, you know, here from Yuma, we know that water's been on our minds, you know, ever since I was a kid. We all know that water is what drives Yuma. And uh, so the rest of the, you know, now that we have Lake Mead as a priority, the rest of the state is understanding that we are in a problem. And so deadlines are not a bad thing. You know, we've been percolating enough during the summer in the conversations that, we know what the issues are that we have to finish arm wrestling off between now and the 31st. And so deadlines aren't such a bad thing, but it will just, it's, we just got to work on that and finish up. There's some key priority things that we'll make sure are there for Yuma County, but you know, it's, it's not partisan. It's just getting it done getting all the stakeholders and then keeping that package that together, it goes to the legislation. So we're on it. Thanks. Yeah. Just, Great. Um, Lisa. Just to add a couple time. things, the letters I gave you, I, I gave you these just so you would know the bumpy road we've been down with the drought contingency plan, plan steering committee um, and with the three work groups. The first letter that I sent was actually uh, November 12th when negotiations broke down. I was afraid we weren't going to move forward at all. And the second one was uh, to the CAWCD board specifically and to all the steering committee members about a, um, an amendment that was brought forth called a friendly amendment that was actually a transfer of water, which Yuma is against. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, uh, there was a lot of reshuffling of the deck with no more water left behind Lake Mead, and we have to keep 500,000 acre feet of water behind, 200,000 more than has been left in prior years in 2020. So. Um, but I wanted you to know that, um, you know, I've been working diligently on this. I don't speak a lot in the meetings. I go home, call, write letters um, in support of not only Yuma County, but also I can tell you that um, my opinions and my position that I vocalized has also been um, very much supported by the Tohono O'odham Tucson, uh, Goodyear, a lot of parts of, of um, the county. Um, and working with the Cocoa Paw as well, and the agricultural community here. So, all right. Well, you know, I got to get people out of here by noon, otherwise they won't be able to make the three o'clock back in, in Maricopa. I want to thank everybody that uh, you know put it all together, staff that put the meeting together, all of you for coming over, for attending, and giving us this presentation. It's invaluable. I think all of us realized there was a lot of work to do, but you know, when it's in front of you. You, you get a you size up the situation, but I think that we have very capable representation in in, uh, in the House and in the Senate, and I think that if we work together as a team, there's almost nothing we cannot accomplish. Eventually, thank you very much. Any of the elected officials here would like to say anything? No, you guys okay? You guys okay? Then fine. Then we'll you know call an end to this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Oh.